When I think about U.S. corporate interests in Africa, and I look over the last five years, I see a bit of an evolution uh, in terms of how U.S. private sector has gotten to the point where it is today. And we've talked a lot about how it isn't where other parts of the world are, certainly not where Asia is and even Europe to some degree. But you do see some incremental progress from the U.S. perspective. And I think that the tide started to change in 2006 when the Council on Foreign Relations published a report that was looking at U.S. policy towards Africa. And the Council on Foreign Relations really noted that U.S. policy needed to change, that heretofore U.S. had always thought of Africa as a destination for charity, but there were now some important strategic reasons that the U.S. ought to pay attention to Africa. And they cited three primary reasons. And those three reasons were, first and foremost, the fact that there's a recognition of the important resources that Africa had. Secondly, um, in 2006, at least, the perspective was around how many of the Northern, European, Northern African countries played a role um, with respect to security and the large Muslim populations in Africa and how we needed to be mindful of those as we sought to uh, develop U.S. policy around security. And lastly, the fact that Africa is one of the epicenters for um, HIV AIDS, and as a result, the U.S. needed to be paying attention to Africa for those three reasons. Then in 2007, you know, playing on this whole theme around the resources, a lot of hedge funds put money into Africa. And this was really sort of hot money, not long-term investment money, not money that was really concerned about the development of Africa, but money that wanted to make a quick profit. And so you had a lot of money, particularly as oil prices were rising, um, going into Africa fr from a resources perspective. 2008 came along, and as you know, we had the global financial crisis, and so there's really a retreat. Um, a lot of those hedge funds decided to keep their money at closer to home. Um, risk was no longer as attractive, and there was a real flight to what was perceived as safety. And 2009, you saw the private sector really just trying to hold on. Um, without any um, diversification, no interest in exotic investments, just trying to hang on to whatever you have was kind of the name of the game. And then 2010 is really when I think the tide started to change. Um, I credit McKinsey for playing an important role in this. I think that McKinsey's report really started to get people focused. If McKinsey's thinking that Africa is a good investment destination, maybe I should start paying attention. And that sort of laid a bit of a ground, uh, laid, laid some of the groundwork in this. Then you had the World Cup, where the world was able to see how South Africa was able to so successfully pull off this, this, this large event without a hitch. And it exposed the world to, you I know, mean, I think seeing is believing in all of the television coverage, seeing the development on the ground, um, played another piece of laying the ground. Um, then you had come up to August in 2010, and Barron's, which a lot of investors read, had a, its cover story was Africa, the next frontier. And this was huge, having an American media outlet like Barron's really acknowledge Africa as an investment destination. And then it was just a big, big tide. It was the third week in September in 2010. Um, during the UN General Assembly meeting when all of the heads of state, including the African heads of state, obviously were in New York, the Clinton Global Initiative, the Millennium Development Goals meeting all took place in New York. And during that week, there were five very significant announcements. Um, Ford made an announcement that Ford Motor Company, that their most profitable region in the previous quarter had been Africa. Um, Alex stepped out of the room, but Coca-Cola made an announcement uh, that their biggest growth market going forward uh, was going to be Africa. IBM made an announcement um, that they were investing a billion and a half dollars in East Africa with Barty Airtel in order to develop voice-enabled uh, email, voice-enabled emails in order to access um, the less literate population in, in Africa. The Harvard Endowment um, announced what its portfolio holdings were, and their ETF portfolio was such that South Africa was the fourth largest country in that portfolio. And then that week was capped off by Walmart's announcement 
that they were going after MassMart, um, a company valued at $4 billion. And that's really when I think the U.S. corporate, uh, U.S. private sector took notice that Africa was on the map. And I think since that time, there's been an increasing focus from U.S. Fortune 500 boards asking their management, what is the Africa strategy? And if you don't have one, well, you need to get one. So I'd like to just back up. We've been talking a lot about what we see as the potential in Africa going forward with some pretty aggressive projections um, that all the previous presenters have put forth that show Africa as a place where one can really see tremendous achievement in GDP growth over the next um, sort of 10 to 40 years. And so the question is, is this realistic? And um, there's a comparison that I think is very helpful to sort of put all of this in perf into perspective, and that is looking at a number of Asian countries in 1960 and where they were in terms of their GDP per capita and how they have grown over the last um, 50, 40, 50 years. Um, taking a look at Niger versus Thailand, Zambia versus Korea, Singapore versus South Africa, and Zimbabwe versus China. If you take a look in 1960, Niger and Thailand both had a per capita GDP of about $1,000. And look at today, um, Thailand is about seven times as large as, Nile, as, um, as Niger with uh, 7,000. Take a look at Zambia versus Korea. It's hard to imagine that Zambia and Korea both had the same per capita GDP in 1960. Um, about $2,000, and you look at where Korea has gone today, just under 25000 Singapore and South Africa. Um, in 1960, Singapore's um, GDP was less than South Africa's on a per capita basis, and today you've got Singapore topping out at $45,000. So a huge, as we all know, um, success story in Singapore. And interestingly, Zimbabwe and China in 1960 were both at about the same place. And now China is at 6,000, and we know Zimbabwe, um, at least at this moment in time, is still on the decline. So I think that that, I'd like to just take a look at these slides because I think that it puts all of this rosy um, trajectory into perspective and shows you know, just how far emerging markets can come. I, I think that there's a reason we use that word emerging because they are growing and changing every day and certainly far from static and that's what makes it exciting. Who's been investing in Africa and what have they been investing in? Um, this is a map, maybe a little bit hard for you to see, but I'll tell you what the points are here. Um, this is looking at the sectors and looking at the countries in Africa. Sort of the color coding is based on the GDP of the nation and, um, and then looking at where, what countries have been investing into Africa. Now this again comes back to the point where most of the um, foreign direct investment into Africa has come from Europe and from Asia, very, very little from the US. Where is that money going? It's gone into the higher GDP countries, certainly a lot into South Africa, and increasing amounts into Nigeria. You see that uh, the population of Nigeria is so significant, even though South, um, Nigeria's GDP today is significantly less than South Africa's, the growth potential for Nigeria means that it is just a force to be reckoned with and cannot be ignored. Governance has certainly played an important role in the destinations um, to which this capital flows. And certainly, Nigeria has made tremendous progress from a governance perspective in the last many years, but there's still a long way to go in that regard. I think there was a question earlier from someone about uh, China and China's role relative to some of the development issues and their policies. And I think that's one of the um, criticisms that often comes up is how China has been relatively agnostic with respect to governance as a consideration for where it puts its money. And as Asha said, I think it's really up to the Africans to hold uh, the feet to the fire um, of those investors that are coming in and to really define the parameters and the terms and conditions on which investment will be accepted. And I think like most things, you know, there, there's good and bad with that. I think that um, on the one hand, China may not have 
forced governance reform in the way many American investors might have, but at the same time, they've accomplished um, the development of infrastructure that simply wasn't there and is playing an important role in the foundation for future investments. So it's interesting. Um, the growth sectors are certainly – or the, the sectors in which people have tended to put their money are the big growth sectors, financial services, retail, and telecom. Um, this is the part where we've talked about quite a bit already, and that is, you know, why are investors focused on Africa today? And, um, you know, sort of the four driving forces, as we've talked about, population being number one, um, the fact that these economies are growing is number two, um, the fact that per capita income is increasing is number three, and lastly, the changing consumer um, spending patterns where there's a lot more urbanization, and you know, urbanization with urbanization comes housing starts, um, with housing starts comes a lot of consumer spending. And so these are some of the four driving reasons that the investors are focused today. What evidence is there that this opportunity um, exists? And so I think there may have been reference to this already, but I'll make a point. The Economist came out with this um, in January of this year, taking a look at the world's 10 fastest growing economies. And from um, 2001 to 2010, Six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world were in Africa. And when we look out over the next five years to 2015, seven of the ten projected fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. Um, here we're just taking a look again at the demographics that we've talked about before. But just again, underscoring this point, I think that this ch first chart on the left shows it from just a population perspective. Um, if you take a look at the sort of 11 largest countries, Africa is, is basically a market of a population um, of a size comparable to India and just slightly shy of Africa. So if you can create a unified market of this population, um, that's a tremendous opportunity. Um, the right side of the chart shows what some of the you know, largest cities are, and there's some very, very large cities. Um, this shows Lagos at 11 million, I've actually heard. Uh, for, you know, some estimates of Lagos' population as being up to 15, 18 million, depending on how you count. But there are certainly a number of large cities which creates the efficiencies needed in order to, um, to realize this investment potential rather than having a very dispersed population over, um, over the land. Um, again, this is looking at the growth in GDP from the 11 African countries that lead in GDP. And this is where they are today, as you can see, kind of in the middle of the pack, projections from Goldman Sachs research, um, is that in 2050, those 11 are going to be right behind India. Growth in the middle class, we've talked about this. This defines middle class as people with over $6,000 per annum in, um, in per capita income. And the main point being here that in 2050, Goldman Sachs research estimates that the middle class in Africa could be um, the same size or even bigger than China's. 